and uh, hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from a news up at Adesawe Kanda, also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, the SFA channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okonse. Tonight, your election command center assesses the place of smaller political parties in Ghana's politics under the Fourth Republic, the traditional Smaller political parties are coming up to conversation now. And how prepared are they from 94 days or 93 days to election day 2024? We'll tell you because today the CPP has selected or elected their flag bearer. What is in it for them? Stay with us here on Ghana tonight. The processes have already started for the rerun of the new patriotic party's primary in the Wale Wale constituency in the northeast region. But there is also some internal wrangling leading to the suspension of some party members in that constituency and stay with us here on your election command center because this is a crucial constituency for the mpp it is the constituency of the flag bearer dr mahmoud obamia or what's happening there stay with us we we'll say on ghana's long fight against galamse and how the matter has unfortunately taken a political twist much to the disappointment of many especially with what's been happening in parliament during this emergency recall period. I say, say, when the last tree dies, the last man dies, they say water is life. And Galamse is destroying all of this water, our forest cover. There's another thing as well that you should be concerned about when it comes to legal mining. Stay with us, we're getting to it. You're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. There are concerns that the two-day sitting by legislators to consider some government urgent businesses was a waste of time as the House could not work on 10 out of the 11 items listed in the majority leader's request for the recall. Minority leader Dr. Casey Latuforsen described the recall as unnecessary. The majority leader, Alexander Fenyomarkin, apologized for the inability of the House to complete the scheduled activities. My expectation was that we would be able to transact the government business we had programmed to transact. Unfortunately, we have not been able to do as expected. I take responsibility and take full responsibility for this inability to transact all the essential government visits. The Ghana Education Service, GES, is assuring it will assist police to investigate circumstances leading to the killing of a student at a really senior high school. Family of the deceased are, however, not impressed. I said the school have rules. But everything will go um, under uh, two weeks. The school will do their investigation, what caused all those problems, together with the police. The family will hold on for that two weeks and hear what they'll come out with. If they don't come out with anything reasonable, I think we'll take the legal action against them. The Convention People's Party has elected Nana Frimpo Malcolm Okuma as their 2024 flag bearer candidate. With 763 votes against their opponent, Nana Frimpo, 586 votes. But flag bearer aspirant Nana Yao Frimpo refused to congratulate her, describing the elections as not being free and fair. You lose fairly. It's so easy to congratulate the winner. If you are robbed by the referee, how can you congratulate the winner? So you will not congratulate her? You, are, you get it from the answer I've given to you.
flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party, Dr. Mohamed Dubaumia, has reiterated his burning desire to reform the public transport sector by replacing diesel and petrol dependent vehicles with electric vehicles. Addressing party supporters as part of the resumption of his Greater Accra Regional Campaign Tour, Dr. Balmia said the reform has been necessary to reduce costs of transportation in the country. Transport prices so so because of two things. Fuel is highly priced. Spare parts, highly priced. Electric vehicles, no need for fuel, no need for spare parts. If you need to be a part of the platform, it is before the end of this year. Yeah, the new NDC flag bearer John Mahama has accepted the second-hand vehicle tag handed him by Vice President and flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahama Dubaumia. Campaigning in Senate West and East of the Bono East region, John Mahama maintained that such vehicles have proven to be reliable as he renewed his commitment to farmers. I accept that I am a second hand vehicle. Second hand vehicles have shown quality and experience than brand new ones. NDC, Amanyoko, Yakuta Omeinda, Ayemim Senya, Naya Setna City, Abra, NDC Wam Abayemo. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time. This is 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, let's get into straight issues to the uh, northeast region of this country, the Wale Wale constituency, uh, because processes have already started for the rerun of the NPP's primary in the Wale Wale constituency in the northeast region. But there is also some internal wrangling leading to the suspension of some party members. We unpack all of those issues tonight and uh, we're getting to it shortly will remain your election command center here across all media journal platforms and remember we're giving you everything you need to know some 93 days to election day december 7 2024 and giving you all the analysis and the details as we go into it but the wale wale constituency is a symbolic one for the mpp the reason being that's the constituency of Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, the flag bearer of the party. And all of these things happening there have direct connection to him. And we'll tell you why shortly here on your election command center. Well, earlier today, in fact, the processes for the nominations to be open for a rerun of the Wale Wale NPP parliamentary primary that started yesterday and the opening of nominations closes tomorrow in that constituency and there's going to be another primary to get that constituency a parliamentary candidate for the NPP on the 8th of September this is just Sunday this Sunday ahead of us now this follows the recent annulment of this January 27 parliamentary primary result that crowned Dr. Kabir Utia uh, as the victor of that constituency's primary so on the ticket of the NPP but it appears Dr. Kabir Utia is determined in fact to come back uh, on the ticket of the NPP represent the party in that Wale Wale constituency he was the first to pick his nomination forms for the rerun of the primaries on Sunday. This is what he had to say after that process. People have so stated that we will need to have representation and they are not backing down on their earlier stance. They are still of the view that I am the rightly, I mean the duly elected candidate and they want to reaffirm that on the 8th of September, that's on Sunday. So they have encouraged me, they have actually asked me, they have actually directed me to pick the nomination form and to contest the elections again. Thank so you. this is what Thank the people have communicated to me. Thank you. I have, I have already, however, told them that aside the youth 
the women, there are also some stakeholders or important elders of this constituency. That will be my last engagement. And what about you, the share with me. I would synchronize that those views with that of the youth and people of Guadalajara and then we'll take a decision. But basically, the signal is that we must go ahead with the contest, we must be forthright in our participation, and we must ensure that this time around, we, the national executive or those going to organize the election must ensure that we have a very clean register yes. so that no one will run to court under the refuge of dead people in the name after the person has lost the elections. Well, that's Dr. Kabrutia Mahama there. He is an advisor at the office of the vice president. Now, the other person in this instance, that's the incumbent member of parliament who took this matter to court, which led to the annulment of the parliamentary results, Hajia Azuera, is yet to, from what we do know, and we'll establish that shortly, whether she'll speak the nomination forms to recontest um, as the parliamentary candidate for the MPP in the Wale Wale constituency. She's also been described as the sister of the vice president. So that's why I tell you about the direct connection of the vice president, apart from the fact that the flag bearer of the party, and this is his constituency, he has direct bearing on, on what is going on there as well. And that's why many have called on him to have spoken about this, for it not to end to the point of it being annulled. But then again, there are many who thought that his silence was even golden in this matter. While at it, the regional chairman of the party suspended two party executives, two MPP executives in the Walla Walla constituency, and a member of the party over misconduct and the violation of the party's constitution. Here's what we do know about this. Take a look at this. Now, from what we have gleaned uh, the, from our sources within the Walla Walla constituency, these three persons, the Al Hassan Suleimana, who is a second vice chair of the Wale Wale constituency for the MPP. Imuro, Tonzua, Mahamudu, the financial secretary, and Megida Saka Sanusi, also a party member, we understand have been suspended. We want to understand why they were suspended. And these are the grounds for the suspension from what we got from our sources within the party in the Wale Wale constituency. Violation of duty as members, breach of the duty to uphold party policies publicly, creation of discord and fa or factionalism within the party, actions detrimental to the party's re reputation and integrity, and then also you say, bringing the party into disrepute or public ridicule. So that's why these three NPP, that's uh, executives and the member, have been suspended in the Wale Wale constituency ahead of the rerun of the primaries for the MPP on Sunday. Now, Christopher Marco is a correspondent. He has been crisscrossing that constituency. He's going to stay with us here uh, ahead of that rerun of the primaries. He's joining us on Zoom. Chris, what more do we know about the suspension of these three persons? Fred, I must say that uh, the suspension rules, uh, just as it's contained in the uh, statement released by the uh, regional chairman of the new patriotic party in the northeast region and uh, like you rightly mentioned it's based on issues of misconduct uh, based on issues of aligning themselves to a particular uh, aspirant uh, in the uh, constituency constituency even ahead of the uh, sunday rerun of the constituency primary so uh, they have been asked to stay away from party activities uh, until a determination is made in uh, that particular matter. So as it stands now, uh, the three persons stand suspended. I see. And uh, do you know whether Haji Azura, the incumbent member of parliament, has picked her nomination forms to recontest um, this primaries on Sunday? Yes, so uh, because uh, it is uh, indicated in the MPP release that... Uh, a person seeking to contest the seat can equally uh, 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 pick their nominations online and other uh, uh, places. So um, we cannot tell as it stands now whether she has uh, picked nomination, but her people, her supporters are saying that there is no two ways about it. She will pick nominations and contest the Sunday uh, 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 primaries. But tell me, you, you, you know this constituency like the back of your palm. What's, what's the temperature there as we speak? Yeah, so, uh, Alfred, I must say right from the day the court uh, uh, judged that there should be a rerun and that the uh, January 27th primary uh, has been annulled, 
I must say that the constituency has not uh, been the same, even though even before the judgment, uh, there has been some uh, issues of temperaments in the uh, constituency, but it is beginning to get high, tensions are getting higher uh, because uh, supporters of uh, Kabi Dr. Kabiru and Hajia uh, are, are intensifying that rivalry, intensifying uh, what we, we knew uh, before the judgment where uh, even some uh, party members were attacked at uh, radio stations because they were communicating for a particular uh, aspirant by then. And so the, the, the cracks are beginning to get even deeper uh, after assistance now that actually uh, resulted in the suspension of these three persons you know even before the primaries the regional chairman uh, was alleged to be supporting the uh, 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 current member of parliament and so uh, every supporter of dr kabiru actually uh, was seen as an uh, enemy or an opponent to to the regional chairman and so uh, when the suspended when when the court annulled the uh, uh, primary result, it, it, it heightened tensions. And so uh, people are beginning to read meanings into it that anyone who goes contrary to the will of the chairman will be dealt with. And that is the fate of the three persons as it stands now. So uh, the home constituency of the MPP flag bearer and things are not going right in the constituency. And so many are beginning to think that the MPP is likely to uh, lose the constituency, even though it's still too early for them to make such uh, judgments. But that is what they are beginning to say. Even after the judgment, the uh, lawyer for the plaintiff, that is to say the lawyer for Hajia Zuelalaba, actually mentioned that uh, the party uh, should have considered him picking a particular person to contest the, the, the constituency uh, uh, as the parliamentary candidate because of the dynamics <laughs> in the constituency, rather than opening up for people to contest. Chris, thank you for this comprehensive detail there. And uh, Christopher Marco is going to be there for us here on the Election Command Center on Sunday when we bring you the coverage of that uh, rerun of the primaries of the MPP in the Wale Wale constituency uh, in the Northeast region. Christopher Marco there. Let's stay a bit further on this. Yeah, a number of issues are play in this constituency. Five issues we have identified here on your election command center. First of all, this is the vice president's constituency, the flag bearer of the MPP. This is his home constituency. This is where he's going to vote. And the two people you're seeing on the screen are the, are the ones who, who went at, at each other in court. Dr. Muhammad Tia Kabiru has been described. In fact, he works in the office of the vice president as an advisor. Haji Al-Ariba Zueratu is the incumbent member of parliament who has also been described as the sister of the flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. And, and so you see that direct connection of the vice president to this. Is that the second issue at play? The third issue at play here, as we're seeing now, is the fact that this constituency is not entirely an NPP constituency. Right? This is not a consequence that the MPP can go to bed and win. And we're going to show you that shortly because the history tells us the dynamics of this Wale Wale constituency. In fact, even the PNC has won this constituency before. And that's where you hear the likes of Christopher Marco say that some are already speculating that the NDC would capitalize on this, this seeming division within the party in the Wale Wale constituency and probably win this constituency, but that is too early to, to say. 93 days is a long time in politics. We'll see how things play out. But there's been a number of press conferences that have been addressed by the members of the party in the constituency, sending a strong message to the vice president, the flag bearer of the party. Elia, take a look. We are coming out to tell Alaji Dr. Mahmoud Bawumia that if he's, if he's not, if we want to lose the seat in the name of Asia, we will let him lose the seat in the name of Asia. <laughs> Because you saying that Ajay is your sister, Ajay is never related to you. If it is not, if the party is not concerned about family, then all of us should go inside and vote our family members. We all have decided that no Dr. Kabiru, no votes. So that's a strong message to the vice president, the flagbearer of the MPP, in, in, in his home constituency, uh, for, for that matter, the Wale Wale constituency. 
before the contest. This is the disputed results or the, the, the results of the first primaries on the 27th of January this year, which was annulled by the court two days ago. Dr. Kabeo Mahama indeed won with 345 of the votes. Haji al Ariba, the incumbent member of parliament, followed closely with 338 of the valid vote cast. This is what was taken to court. And then uh, the court quashed it because of issues that Haji al Ariba raised about some the the eligibility of the electoral register that was used. Some persons who voted in there did not have the right to do so. You see Tahiru Sham, 145, and then Jangdu Mahama came, came in through with just one vote. But we do not know whether, for instance, the third person in there, Tahiru Sham Una, who also had some, some very good numbers, 145 of the, of the votes cast on that day, is also going to recontest or seek another bite at the cherry in the Walla Walla constituency. But this is how things played out on the 27th of January. These results don't hold anymore. But then again, take a look at this. This is what's happening when it comes to the historical analysis in the Walla Walla constituency. And that's why it's not a seat even for, for, for the presidential that the NPP can actually go to bed and, and win. In 1996, the NDC actually led in that constituency with over 70% of the valid vote cast. Right? In the year 2000, the reason why you don't see both the MPP and the NDC showing the year 2000 is that in that particular year, the PNC, Dr. Edward Mahama, won that Walawale constituency. MPP and NDC did not show up for even for the presidential. And that is the same in the parliamentary. Parliamentary, the PNC won. A PNC candidate in the Walawale constituency won the parliamentary in, in that constituency, even though eventually in, in, in the subsequent years, this PNC candidate decided to join the NPP when Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya was selected as a running mate to Nanado Dankwe Kufado going into the 2008 election. So eventually he became an NPP member. But it's put it on record that in the year 2000, the PNC won. In 2004, the NDC came back and won that seat twice in a row, 2004 and 2008, with 36.9 of the valid vote cast. And then if subsequently in the year 2008, even when... We saw uh, John Evans Tamils winning that election after a runoff with 45.6% in the Walla Walla constituency. The NPP then, even though the NDC won the presidential in the 2012 election with John Dramani Mahama, the NPP won the presidential or led in the presidential in the Walla Walla constituency with 53.2% of the valid vote cast. And the trend has been the case till the 2020 elections. In 2016, they retained it there with 54.8. If you look at the parliamentary, the NDC has held that seat three times. The NPP has also held it three times, including the 2020 elections where Haja Laribazwira won that constituency. In the year 2000, the PNC won that constituency with their candidate as well. So if you talk about elections at least over the period at least since 1996 to date the MPP and the NDC share they share the pie in this Walla Walla constituency going at it the same numbers 3-3 three, three. from 1996 2000 2004 2008 the NDC held it 2012 2016 2020 the MPP has been holding this constituency since this is the 2000 election the Isi Fuazuma of the PNC won this Walla Walla constituency and look at what happened with the MPP and the NDC. And then for the parliamentary, for the presidential, Edward Mahama won in the year 2000 elections. And then if you look at the 2020 elections, see the closeness between Haji al and Abdallah Abubakar. Abdallah Abubakar is the NDC candidate. And he polled a little over 30,000. Haji al won that seat with just a little over 32,000 of the valid vote cast, about 51.2%. That tells you that it's just a little more work than then the NDC is also going to show up strongly. But here's what's happening going into this election. Whereas the MPP is having their struggles with selecting a candidate for the home constituency of the vice president, the flag bearer of the party, the NDC has retained Abdullah Abubakar, their 2020 candidate because of the good showing that he put up over 30,000 of the votes cast there. He, they've retained him for the 2024 elections. So he's also going to be watching quite closely how things are playing out in the MPP and probably might be smiling right now.
But guess what? We'll wait to see what happens on Sunday and how quickly the party is able to close its ranks going into election day 2024. But this is what is happening in the Wale Wale constituency. Here on your election command center, we will be there on Sunday. We will also bring you live coverage and updates of the happenings there. Stay with us. Coming up next on your election command center, we assess the, the, the place of smaller political parties traditionally in Ghana's politics under the Fourth Republic as the Convention People's Party elects its flag bearer. That's a fundamental question that we're asking tonight. Are these parties prepared to give a good showing in the elections? We do not know whether the CPP is going to fill the candidate in all 276 constituencies, parliamentary candidates, the PNC as well. The PNC is yet to elect their flag bearer. And then also we have the, the others, smaller ones as we've seen. Um, the APC as well, Hassan Ayariga, uh, adored his run, running mate today. But are they going to fill 276 parliamentary candidates going into this election? Those are the questions on the minds of many. So earlier, my colleague Joe Blaboja hit the streets, interacted with members of the general public as to whether they believe that these traditionally smaller political parties can cause a stir or be the third force going into this election. Take a look. Oh, NDC and MPP are, are the people ruling us. So are those third parties, unless they try hard or they use some magic to have, because I'm not sure. We are not even hearing of them. Up to now, I don't even know some of the parties' flag bearers. So you do need a magic. When it comes to the smaller uh, parties, you don't see anything that shows that they are ready for this upcoming election. Nothing. Like, you don't even see... They don't even have an office. You don't get to see them. I mean, they should come up with, with a message. And they should be out here. They should come out for us to tell them how we feel. So they can give us policies to counter, I mean, the, the reigning parties. So we know that, yes, they are ready. If we had that chance, we give everybody opportunity. But they say Ghana, I say MPP and the NDC. So what I would say is they don't have that chance to. No matter how they will try, they will not have that chance. Because Ghana is about MPP and NDC. No other political party is allowed to. They are allowed to, but they will not win, no matter how they try. If I go and vote for them, I don't think others too will vote. So I will not waste my vote on someone who will not win. So I will try to give it to someone who will win. As of now, they've not organized themselves. They, they don't, the party structures are not there. Nothing shows that they, they, have, they, they are any serious party. Parties, they have to build their structures. And as of now, have you heard them organizing any, even uh, constituency elections or branch or any ward elections? As of now, they've not. Because you have to build the structures from the grassroots. You build it up to the national level. But if even the grassroots doesn't exist, so that's the verdict of the people about the smaller political parties and whether they are really serious getting into this election 93 days away from today. But today, the CPP elected Nana Frimpoma Kuma Kuma as their 2024 flag bearer with some 763 votes against her opponent, Nana Frimpong, uh, with 58 votes. He's a historian. Nana Sapong Kuma Kuma was a former chairperson of the CPP. Now, she called for unity to ensure victory for the CPP ahead of this election. Take a look. I believe that in a political party as, such as ours, it's just, it's, it's one person would have to win. Yeah. And once one person has won, especially when it's so decisive, it only needs to have unity moving forward. This is a victory for the Convention People's Party. I am a woman of organization. I believe in mobilizing people. I believe in helping the vulnerable. This is who I am. It is in my DNA. And I can assure my colleague lawyer here that there will be no more zeros in the on Act 20 comes December 7th. There will be no more zeros at the police station when counting the Convention People's Party. And that is why the people at the grassroots chose me because they know that I represent organization. 
that's uh, CPP Flagbury elect today. You know why she's saying there'll be no more zeros? We've seen in previous elections that CPP in some polling stations get zero. Zero for the parliamentary or even the presidential candidate. Zero. It says it's not going to happen. They are breaking the zero. While the MPP also seeks to break the eight. Right? But her opponent refused to congratulate her, describing the election as not free and fair. It's a flawed one. This is the historian. Take a look. When you lose fairly, it's so easy to congratulate the winner. If you are robbed by the referee, how can you congratulate the winner? So you will not congratulate her? You, are, you get it from the answer I've given to you. Do you recognize her as your flag bearer going forward? I've already answered you. I've already answered the question. By not congratulating her? By not recognizing the entire result as a genuine reflection of what we toiled for. You know, I have toiled in the country marketing myself over the years. You have the opportunity to go to court if you feel these are foul results. I would never do that. I would never do that. I would have to look for an alternative, an alternative way of serving Mother Ghana, an alternative way of projecting whatever I do. Will you still sit with the CPP going forward? Will you still be a member of the CPP? Let me answer you by telling you that the December 7th election will not be a CPP election, but it will be a Ghana election. And I'm for Ghana. He says he's for Ghana, but then again, he's not going to uh, congratulate. But in fact, we're getting indication that he may go independent. But that's Yawa Nochi Frimpong. He's a historian, private legal practitioner. Nana Frimpong uh, Sapong Kuma Kuma is a flag bearer. Like, she's joining us on the telephone. Congratulations to you, madam. It's in order. Thank you very much. And um, uh, a good evening to all your listeners. Your, your, your Yes, and I'm not going to keep you too long. I can see that you're stressed, you lost your voice, uh, yes. obviously, because you're happy you've won the election. But your opponent is not accepting this. He says this is a flawed election and it wasn't free and fair. So he hasn't congratulated you, at least as at 8 p.m. when we spoke to him. Has the situation changed? Um, the point is that I'm not, I didn't lose my voice from celebration. I lost it from working. Since we went to uh, next a week ago, last Wednesday, I just came home last, about two days ago. I've traveled the length and breadth of the country. I had to quickly go through. I've worked as a chair and leader of the Convention People's Party. Everybody is aware of how, how hard I work and all the up and downs and turbulent situations in the party. And I'm still here. So it's one of those things that for all the things that can be said, that should be believed. Today is the day for CTP. Today is the day for my day. Like we used to say, when I mean in our day. This is our day, a day for CTP, a day for celebration for the youth of this country, in, in, a day for the vulnerable, uh, and a day for the marginalized. Uh, and that's why we are... It's a day to worry about people who don't know how to accept defeat and just move on in life. Simple like that. I see. So you're not concerned that your not your friend Paul hasn't congratulated you, accepted this victory? I, I, I really didn't notice uh, what he said. I, I heard him speak as usual. And for me, I wasn't listening to the details of whatever was being said. I was sitting there just ready to make my acceptance speech, and that's what I did. I, if he said anything, I really didn't hear him well. And, and be honest with you. Uh, but it's nothing. This is something that happens with some people. It's not everybody in life who can accept the fact that they have got, they've been defeated, especially by a woman, and they have to move on. I mean, from the things that he, I just heard him say right now, I haven't heard it before, it, it looks like he's looking at an alternative. He had an alternative before he joined the party, I mean, before he joined the race. So what would be new? Nothing. CPP has just won. My victory is a victory of the muscle of the party. My victory is a victory and a confirmation of the fact that the, the people in the Convention Reports Party want a change. And that change will express to the, the youth of the country. So I, I really am excited. It is in history. Uh, this is the first time that a party that has won, that has been in government before, has won... Um, 
has, has really injected a woman I, I to, see. to be the presidential candidate. So for me, it's a history that needs to be celebrated. Uh, right, and so you're going to be the first woman to have led the party as flag bearer since 1996. That's something good to talk about as well. But then again, are you going to field parliamentary candidates in all 276 constituencies? No, no, we can't do all the 27. No, no, we can't do that. We, we, it's a little bit late, and um, we would feel the ones that we are, We know we have people that have already started, like the, the, the gentleman in tomorrow has been working for some time. There are a few of them that have really been out there working, and uh, definitely would, would continue to work in that area. I see. So but you... we don't feel that everybody is too late. Right, but you can't put a number to it as to how many constituencies you're going to uh, fail candidates. I, I know we're looking around 50 to uh, 80, but I, I'm not, I can't say for sure the numbers that we're going to do today. But I just know that the party um, had some numbers that they were working on. So right. I'm sure I would find out what the details are as we move forward. Are you mentioned... be very soon, by, right. by next week. Indeed. You, you mentioned Jamara, and, and that brings to mind the fact that the former member of parliament, who's a daughter of you, the founder of your party, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, I'm talking about Samia Yaba Nkrumah, she says she's, gonna, she's contemplating going as an independent candidate as well. That, that yes, should she, worry she you, that, is it not? No, 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 I'm not worried at all. She did that before. The last, last election, she did that. Samia uh, Nkrumah, our, our, our dear sister, actually... Um, less active participation in the CPP when she lost in 2016. She's still dear to her heart. Any day she's ready to join, to come back, CPP is open for her. We, we wish her the best, but we must move on. <laughs> the party, the, 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 the situation in the country, as we see today, is, it's not just about the problems that we face as a party. But the problems that the nation faces as a nation, we, Convention People's Party, brought in the, 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 the Ghana that we're discussing today. We fought for the independence. So we can still come and fight for the, the economic independence that has eluded us. And that is exactly the focus. It's about the economy, the I economy, see. the economy. And right. that's exactly what we are going to focus on. And in fact, we're going, to, we're going to have an extensive conversation with you about the policies and what you intend to do because you've been chairperson before, now you're a flag bearer. And, and I get the sense in your victory speech, you talk about no more zeros, no more zeros. So you're going to break the zero, correct? That is that, that's the first step. In anything I'm a woman, the first thing I do is try and solve immediate problems. The first problem that we need to solve is to ensure, and that is what I've been talking about, don't forget that I've also be, uh, been a running mate before. I was a courage running mate. So I've been a running mate uh, in, 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 with the Convention People's Party, and I, I knew what was the problem. So when I took the, the, the chair and leader's position, my focus was on nothing but grassroots mobilization. We've done to some extent about 90% of that. The little percentage that is left is for us to go ahead right. and start doing one or two things. So, yes, that would be my focus to ensure that in every police station, in every corner of this country, there is a door open for the people and to be able to come and take over the party so that they can be able to, 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 be able to do what is best for them. Every young person listening to me has an Nkuma spirit in him or her. And Nkuma spirit is a spirit of selfless dedication a selfless education that puts right. the welfare of people right. at the center of every policy and everything we do. And, and, and I, I promise you this. I, 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 I promise you we'll, we have a date, right? I mean, Wonderful. a conversation in the coming days, Wonderful. right? And um, we'll talk some more on this. Uh, congratulations, Nana. From Poma Sapon Kuma Kuma uh, is the flag bearer elect for the CPP. This is your election command center. Coming up next, we stay on the long fight against illegal mining, Galamse, and how the matter has unfortunately taken a political twist, much to the disappointment of many. And this is has got a number of you. Uh, talking ahead of tonight as we put up that question as to whether there's been leadership shown in the fight against illegal mining 
in this country. And you can go on our Facebook and X pages, uh, three hours to the show, as we always do. We put up a question to engage a lot of you and, and share your thoughts and your mind with us. But many are those who did not take kindly to the comments made by the Member of Parliament for the Insulma Dwejuri constituency. He's also the majority chief whip in this eighth parliament, Frank Anodompre on, on Galamse. When the matter came up in parliament yesterday, the majority chief whip sought to draw a comparison between the MPP and the NDC as to who caused more damage and destruction to our water bodies, the legal mining. This is exactly what the member of parliament said. Take a look. Problems. We all know now there is water shortages all over in Ghana, particularly in Kumase, particularly in Mansia, where the running mate of MPP is coming from. If we are to look and investigate, you polluted the water more than us. You polluted the water more than us. Well, so that's the comment. You polluted the water more than us and reduced this rather serious issue to the comparison of the MPP and DC and who polluted water bodies more. <laughs> Adam Sinanu is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption and has been looking into this quite closely. He's joining us on Zoom. So, Sinanu, this is the comment coming from the, the, one of the leaders in parliament for that matter. How did this strike you? Outrageous and irresponsible, as I said. Absolutely outrageous and irresponsible. Stop behaving like children, uh, small boys in a, in, a, in a football park, you know making a trivial banter out of this. You were elected to take action, elected to, to promote the best interests of citizens. You don't come up and say, your group, what not? Is that why they're in parliament? They think that's what we want to hear on TV and radio? Absolute nonsense. It doesn't make sense. It absolutely doesn't make sense. Look at the level of the crisis. You see, if you're making this statement, and maybe at the time it was okay, maybe you would want to just say, let them go. But at this point, fourteen thousand turbidity, and they are talking when when our system is not even supposed to be doing two thousand ceiling of thousand thousand five. And you are here joking around with it. This kind of insensitivity to the, the feelings of citizens must stop. And they should stop just patting each other's backs and, and trying to make this as, like, as if it's not an important thing for Ghanaians. We need to take immediate action now. They should not forget that this president put his presidency on the line if he didn't deal with this thing. This point. If you're talking about integrity, if you're talking about people who mean what they say, we should see him taking some action. What it meant was that I will step down if I'm not going to get results. And they are not talking about that. They are saying what? You made it more dirty or what? You made it more poisonous. And it is something funny. And people don't see anything wrong with that. Highly outrageous and irresponsible behavior. Hmm. We didn't elect them so they'll come back and be giving us talk back on, on things that are not what bring solutions. Hmm. Let's get real. And let our leaders behave like mature people in this country. Hmm. Well, Masano, you're livid. And, and in fact, this, this reflects the same reaction that a number of people have had to that statement by the majority chief whip, Frank Anodompre. You say an, an irresponsible comment, you, you describe it, but has there been leadership shown over the period in the fight against illegal mining in this country, from where you sit? Absolutely not. You know, we say everything thrives on leadership, falls and rises on leadership. Leadership is cause, everything else is effect. Good leadership means that you, you bring people around, you brainstorm, you get the solutions you implement. If they don't work, you modify them. You, by all means, get to a point. But this one is clearly a human behavior issue. This is not about a, a, a lack of capacity to enforce and make sure it is not that. 
There are so many other jurisdictions. You see it online. People are doing comparisons. That the laws, the policies, and the enforcement are working. And the only reason why it, it would not be working in Ghana is because there are people who are complicit and they are conflicted and they are refusing to act. In other countries where people have integrity and they value ethics, when you're not able to perform, you just say, I will resign. Let other people come in and rethink this and let's see what we can do. But we have people who will just sit there, they're not getting us the results, and they want to do comparisons. Is that serious behavior? Is that what leadership in this country has been reduced to? I think we should all make sure that they know that we are, we are very displeased with this kind of attitude and talk. They need to apologize to us. And if they assume that uh, uh, when another hmm. party comes, then that too will be acceptable. All of them, whether on the majority side or the minority side, to curtail this kind of absolutely unacceptable behavior. Hmm. But, 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 so, no. so, really... <laughs> I'm getting so many comments based on how upset and angry you are, which indeed is, reflects the same position that a lot of people have taken on this matter. You kept making reference to the fact that the president said he was prepared to put his presidency on the line some seven years, almost seven years ago. Now, are you saying that based on that statement, some action or should have been taken by now? You talk about resignation and so on. Is that what you're pointing to? The president ought to have been coming back to say, I am handing in my resignation because I failed. Or else he should be telling us, I know, I have, I've called a strategic meeting and we are governized. I mean, there should be action. That is being honest. That is being showing integrity. It shouldn't be just silence. And his ministers and those who are in government with him ought to be taking action. They shouldn't be quick to think that that game, they think we will all accept it. They should have come back to say, these are the actions we are going to take now. We need to hold our leaders to the highest standards of accountability. Otherwise, this country is not moving forward. And that's our fear. You look at the manifestos, you are not seeing how strategically they are thinking through to address the core issues. At least in my sector of anti-corruption, to see anything very serious. The, the, the strategic issues that you should do, political party financing, it's nothing on it. Right. Right. Is that no Illicit enrichment. There's nothing on it. Hmm. And, and I do thank you so much for venting out the spleen and also that, that, that uh, frustration with, with this. You're not alone in this, I can tell you for a fact. If you go on our Facebook page at TV3 Gun on Facebook, there's so many people. Um, who align with you on this. But thank you for joining us. He's the uh, chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption, joining us here on Ghana tonight. Up next, a manifesto check. We focus on the fight against corruption and what promises the political parties have made. Adam Senano says, nothing really convincing. Stay with us. We're back shortly. Welcome back to Manifesto Check here on your Election Command Center. We're live on TV3, Ghana on Facebook, and on DSCV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Lots of you already getting into the analysis that we've been doing over the period. It's good, is it not? At least you've set people thinking about what Very, very good. But the question that many are asking is if these manifestos really sway people, because the thinking is that many people have already taken their stance. Mm. They really do not care what manifestos present. I mean, I don't know if you subscribe to that line of thinking, though. Well, it, it, could, it could be the case. I mean, to the extent that the political parties must, in their own stride, come and show us which of the promises they have, they have fulfilled yeah. and the ones that they haven't, and be honest about it, that, you know what, we have failed in doing ABCD, so sorry about it. But how much, no. how many of the people will be swayed by the manifesto? Indeed. However satisfying it is. Anyway, welcome to Manifesto Check. And today, our focus is going to be something that, in the past, was a key determinant of who um, largely the people would have voted for. But along the line, I think it, it lost its team. As the polls would show, mm -hmm. corruption is no longer one of the things that people consider the most. Right. I mean, when we showed the polls at that time, you could see that the economy was there, jobs, education, yeah. and then corruption came somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Not as much 
uh, a factor that drives votes as it used to do in the 2016 there about. True. But of course, it's still relevant. When you look at the manifestos of the key parties, they've spent considerable time um, spelling out what their plans would be if they come into power and how to address it. But mm -hmm. of course, for the MPP, which is already in power, now seeking to break the eight, and I'm just learning today that they're also seeking to break the, the zero. zero. I was surprised myself. Anyway. Well, so seeking to break the eight, you'd find that in their manifesto, they talk about continuing from where they left off. Uh -huh. They tout some of their successes by way of some legislations that have made in respect of um, fighting corruption, resourcing and retooling corruption institutions and all that. Um, but may I say that when he comes, he will continue from there, but of course, he also do other things. One of the key drivers for the MPP, for instance, is what they call it digitization. digitalization. Mm -hmm. For them, they think it's one of the key things that is going to, I mean, reduce human interface, and then eventually that would lead to a reduction in corruption. But that's, of course, in itself, we can subject it to some scrutiny. Absolutely. Because we've seen what has happened to the passport office. True. I mean, we've digitized, they digitalized the process. You make the application online, but there are still cases of, I mean, reported cases of corruption. The foreign yeah, affairs yeah. minister had to storm the police to complain largely True. as to how middlemen have somehow, some way, been able to get into the picture. Our kind of digitization is, is relative. We look at what happened at the Tamamoto way. We had an automated Tobo at Tobo, some point. Yes. We, operated by human beings. But, I mean, I mean so there has to be a day we have to look at this whole talk about digitalization and how it operates in this country. Of course, you find universities ask you to apply online. You apply online, they still ask you to print the hard copy and submit to the school. I mean, we should do away with the, 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 hard, the hard copy. But this is what the MPP ca captured in their 2024 manifesto by way of fighting corruption. Now, these are just things that I've teased out that have to do with um, a very vexed matter. This matter came up strongly when the issue of Cecilia Adapa came up right. and there was the conversation about asset declaration and how it ought to be done and how it ought not to be done. Mm -hmm. There are many who think that our current regime is not as transparent as it's supposed to be and I think the parties have listened to this except that they are not incorporating exactly what stakeholders have been saying or civil society have, have been advocating for. So I quite remember that civil society for instance say that it is not right that in asset declaration you only declare your assets, you send it to the Auditor General, it's not opened until there's an issue and the court orders that we look at what is there. They want it to be done publicly. That's right. So, I mean, that has been factored in into the MPP manifesto where they say that they will review Article 286 of the Constitution and the relevant legislation on asset and liability declaration. Two, what they want to do is to expand the asset declaration by public office holders to include, among other things, senior staff and heads of regulatory and public institutions not previously covered, so they want to expand the scope of it and also require asset declaration to be made or updated every two years instead of every four years. So this is what they want to do. It does not capture the point where civil society, for instance, is making the case that it should be made publicly. Mm. Now, when we look at what is contained in the NDC manifesto, they also have the same thing, where they talk about a review and enforce the asset declaration regime in Chapter 24 of the Constitution and the public office holders, that Declaration of Assets and Disqualification Act 1998, Act 550, to promote transparency and check corruption. They do not explain how they will promote transparency and what the review is going to be That's about. Right. Hmm. So now, some further detail is needed there. Yes, today hmm. we, have, we have a new, a new addition in there, Movement for Change. Yes. They also align when it the comes G to this. GTP. GTP. They say that for them, they also amend the existing asset declaration rules to strengthen disclosure and introduce new forms of asset tracking and recovery, including but not limited to instruments such as lifestyle audits for tracking unexplained wealth and recovery of proceeds of corruption. But what really um, have these advocates of the reforms for this uh, asset declaration and the passage of the conduct of public officers, been, what have they been asking for? Mm -hmm. Um, one, one of the key individuals who have been speaking, I mean, about this. Is
a former Auditor General, Yao Daniel Domolevu. It required do it the part. Yes, so clearly there's a call for a review of the asset declaration. The public declaration. Yes, so we all get to know. But we don't see that clearly stated in the manifestos of the NDC, the MPP, the Movement for Change, maybe CPP or PNC or. Um, um, the new force, new force. perhaps. Would, would put public declaration. That's in the kind of the public officers bill, is it not? Yes. I see. Because if you want testimony for the parliamentary seat in your constituency, I need to know how many cars you have, how many houses I mean, you it's have. Only fair. Before it's, it's only getting fair. Into public it's only office. fair when you assume public office, we get to know I mean, what you are made of. What are you hiding? <laughs> anyway, so that's it for manifesto check for tonight. We come away again next week, hopefully. <laughs> for the greater good. Thank you. Thank you so much. But before we go, this is what a number of you have been sharing with us, the question we put on Facebook. And please make some time, three hours to the show on Ghana tonight. We always engage you. Take a look at this. Has government showed leadership in the fight against illegal mining? We had close to 1,300 of you taking part over the one-hour period. And 85% of you say not at all. 5% of you say yes. Government has showed leadership. 7% of you say, you know what, you don't know about it. Okay, so that's it. On our, on our WhatsApp channel as well, 581 of you say government has not shown leadership in the fight against illegal mining in this country. Well, keep the conversation going. On behalf of the rest of the team, thank you for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow for another conversation. My name is Alfred Okonse. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simply superior.